Some stories are just that. Stories. Some are told, though, as warnings to be heard and respected. When these stories are ridiculed, ignored, and scoffed at, one should prepare for the consequences of that disrespect. There's a noise in the forest, and it follows you through the woods. It's so quiet out here. Really, really quiet. And you start to wonder why the birds aren't chirping. And that the trees stand still. Ensure that you're watching carefully for the shadows in these woods. And don't be foolhardy when exploring the woods. A simple dare can take you places whose echoes are that of pain, screams of agony, and voices lost in the darkest recesses of the woods. Welcome, listeners, to your three tales, The Red Sky, The Whaler, and The Waterfall. A big thank you to my Earl Grain forces, Chad Warren, Just Heather, Lee Bauer, Lorraine Crisanto, Mace Joe, Michelangelo Yacone, Paige Marcini, and Peter Raffaelli, and my very special white tea warlord, Matthew J. Bauer. All of you are the lifeblood that courses through this podcast veins. Thank you so much. If you want to support the show, you can donate one, three, five dollars per month with varying rewards. And becoming my enforcer means I dedicate a story just to you. A whole episode with your name stamped on it to the end of time. Also, if you want to be in the shoutouts, any support will ensure your place in the shoutout list. Now, turn your lights off, the sound up, and get ready for something cryptalicious. Red Sky Dawn The Flock A term alien to those who do not weekly go to the Barker King mountain trails and hike is a common word used against these hikers among their kind. A special kind of people who were no, are true mountain men and women. It's a group mentally against their kind where every hiker in the group must contribute to the group. And in return, the rest of the flock will keep you safe and secure. As a group, they establish rules that everybody must and will follow. One of them is to never stray too far from the flock. This was taught upon the younger one of the group. And if they did not obey the all-important rule, the Barker Beast would get them. The Barker Beast is described as a large winged creature with a beak as vicious as saw blades, claws as sharp as a sword, and a body as hard as a giant redwood. It had two beautifully murderous eyes, colored black as sackcloth, with irises as red as blood. The story circulated in the early 1920s, when Randall and Helen Clive took their six-year-old son, Peter, out for a little walk, through the trails. Helen told the boy, I'd suggest you stay close to us, lest the beast gets you. Peter asked his mother, What's the beast? And his mother responded with a short, sweet and simple response. You're doomed. Peter didn't stray even a centimetre from his two loving and caring parents, who protected him from the beast. No such beast was ever reported from any of the local rangers, But rumour has it that there are indeed reports of the beast being sighted in the trails, but the rangers are too afraid to send out a notice of it. No murders have been reported in the trails, yet people end up going missing, at least so much as three, maybe four times in two weeks. The story has been passed down from generation to generation, and each time it keeps the little ones in line, single file lines, Even most young and old adults fear the Barker Beast, having terrified them while they were still young. However, in one camping trip reported in the 90s, one teenager didn't believe so. The young adult was named Dawn Binder, a 17-year-old girl belonging to the middle-class Binder family, consisting of her, her mother, Virginia, her father, Simon, and her younger brother, Joey. 
When she was a little one in the single file lines of her family's flock, she believed deeply in the story of the Barker Beast, so much so it traumatized her. To the point where she became the youngest child to be institutionalized at the local mental facility. She'd been recently released, and she had indeed changed. Gone was Virginia and Simon Binder's beautiful young daughter, who asked them to protect her from the big bad beast in her place. A punk type and rebellious little bitch of a daughter, whom they somewhat loathed, came to be. What happened to her in the facility has not been revealed to the public at this moment in time, though it's suspected that her brain had been fast-forwarded, a term used rarely by those who help speed up a young child's personality to that of a 15-year-old. This has been denied on numerous occasions in interviews and responses to statements from the Binder family and more. Dawn hesitantly went along with her parent on this trip, attempting to try and get along with them after eight years in the loony bin. Only Dawn noticed the sky began to slowly turn to a light red salmon color. Why is the sky a bit fishy? She asked. Sky? Fishy? Dawn, you must be seeing things that aren't there, darling. Her mother responded in that usual, sensual voice she always had on, no matter who it was. I think she means the sky is a different color, dear. Everyone sees the sky differently. Simon responded to the air-headed Virginia. I think she's crazy, Joey exclaimed wanted to put his less than two cents in. I'll knock you crazy, Dawn responded with a hint of seriousness. That's enough, you two. Now, let's get moving. We're paying good money for this. Virginia broke the two up with her attracting voice, and they walked, single file line, as usual per flock rules, all except for Dawn. About two hours into the trip, Joey strayed from the flock. Simon gathered him back, and Virginia told him the tale of the Barker Beast. It's complete bullshit, Joe. The old man and woman are just telling you that to scare you, so you won't get kidnapped. The eldest sibling told the immature youngest out of earshot to the old man and woman. Joey, being the immature youngest child, cattled on her to the parents. This is where an all-too-familiar scenario broke out among the parents and Dawn. Girl does something to get angry, and does something to worry them. Parents start criticizing her. Girl argues with them. Parents argue with her. And they calm down. The end, right? Not this time. The end was only a beginning. Instead of them all calming down, Virginia who had enough of her daughter, no, she didn't deserve that word, that filthy little girl, behavior. So she pulled her wrist back and gave her a backhand across the face. Simon sided with her daughter on this, Virginia having gone a bit too far. Dawn instead ran off, deep and deeper into the woods with each adrenaline-fueled heartbeat. The darkness seemed to come quicker, and Dawn saw refuge in a cave near the cliffs, where the beautiful ocean was illuminated by the dark silver moon. Sleep also came faster than expected, and she fell asleep in the cave near the cliffs. When Dawn came to, she noticed it was quite dark inside the cave, it being day. She noticed an eerie color near the opening, sackcloth. She was not a religious person per se, but sackcloth color was a preferred color of her choice. She slowly moved towards it, and it started glowing a new shade. No, a new color entirely. Blood. Red. She shivered and walked outside. The first thing she noticed was the sky. The sky had turned from the once beautiful and bright blue sky and had instead been replaced with a dark and macabre blood red. It was as if the sky had been stabbed by the hand of God, and the blood had stained and spread, tainting the brilliant colors of the sky with this liquid red color. There wasn't a sun in the sky, and this struck Dawn 
as odd. Since the sun was always bright enough to see in the blue sky, except this was not her sky. This was something else entirely, she thought. She left the cave and looked over the cliffs. What really scared her was none of these, except what she saw over the cliffs. Down on the ocean blue ground, there was nothing. Nothing but an empty void of blackness. Once there was many a sight to see from the cliffs, birds flying overhead, the occasional ship passing by, and the beautiful ocean. Gone. All gone. Swallowed up by this void. Her instinct kicked in quickly, and she thought she had gone a bit cuckoo. She quickly raced back to where her flock's car was parked, and yet, there was nothing. There was no parking lot, just the woods. There was not a single living being she could find or see. There weren't any birds chirping, no sound at all, not even wind blowing. The void had cut her off from the rest of the world, if this even was still her world at all. Wherever Dawn was, she was definitely not back on Earth, and yet despite this feeling of ultimate isolation, she felt that she was being watched. She stared into the void for the longest time, thinking about going through it to look for her flock, yet she thinks there's something in it, watching her. This thought was quickly dismissed as fear, and then she considers being swallowed up by the void. With nothing else to do, she headed back for the cliffs and arrived quickly, staring at the ocean void. There then came a loud and haunting screech from the void, and one thing came to Dawn's mind. The Barker Beast. There was a sudden burst of wind from the void as something rose up. A giant, nearly ten story, a beast rose from the void and stared at Dawn with its bleeding, oh lord, its bleeding eyes. She let out a whimper, trying to remain still, as was the course for a bear attack. But this was no bear. This was... The Beast. The Barker Beast had just risen from beyond the infinite void, and it had risen for her. It lets out that screech and flew towards her. She finally screamed and dashed into the caves, the entranceway being too small for the beast to enter. It had landed a deep wound on her back, and she laid in a cave on her stomach, crying and realizing her childhood trauma was all but too real. Hours, maybe even a day or two passed, and she had become woozy and tired from the wound. Her condition worsened quickly, due to the lack of sleep, because of her adrenaline, and her wandering mind not focusing, going places it hadn't gone since eight years away. Occasionally, the beast would let out a screech again, and only then the wind would appear. This continued, for the longest time, Dawn didn't know how much, but she wanted it to just end. Despite all of this, she couldn't and didn't care. She was tired, injured, going a bit delirious and near death. She wanted it all to stop, and the only way that could happen was the beast. During her time in the cave, a thought reappeared constantly. She had thought about it long and hard and she came to the conclusion, fueled by her damaged mental state, that there was no escape. Simple as that. She lay there almost endlessly, and she was no further than going back to her world than she was at the beginning. She had given up and quit. There was no escaping this hell, and she could always continue to lay there, had it not been for her life-threatening injuries. But for how long would she have lasted without them? Three weeks without food? A whole week without water or hydration? All she'd be doing is torturing herself, with her pointless attempt to stay in the cave and sit it out. She should have let the beast kill her, and death was her only escape now. With that solved, Dawn limped out of the cave, and stood over the cliffs looking down. She closed her eyes, and heard the beast felt the wind brushing against her face and clothed body. She thought her childhood happy thoughts, playing with her parents, having fun, spending time with the ones she loved. 
a small smile appeared on her face, and she cried. The Barker Beast then flew towards her, and she leaned, falling towards the void. The beast then pierced her small body with its claws, and the impact was sudden and quick. She had died instantly. With the prey it so desperately required cooked, it returned to its place inside the infinite void, to enjoy feeding off of Dawn's emotions and feelings, awaiting its next prey. The flocks that come through always have a sizable meal to enjoy, and who knows, it could be you next. Remember this rule. Stay with the flock, lest the beast gets you. The Whaler In the autumn of 2004, a string of cryptid sightings sparked a 4chan thread into existence about the supposed creature known as the Whaler. Illustrations of it range from a hairless monkey or dog to a naked human. Descriptions later used to invent the rake creepypasta. The consensus on the 4chan thread is that the creators of the rake base their stories on the Whaler sightings. But their fictional creature is nothing, compared to the beast discussed in the thread. I advise you to read the rest of this post at your own risk, considering the whaler may appear to those who learn too much about it. The thread is difficult to find, so I decided to share some of the writings here. Here is what I found. Our dog, Pepper, disappeared about a month ago, along with most of the other pets in the neighborhood. I went looking for her in the woods, since that's where she loved to prant about and chase chipmunks. However, I didn't want to believe it when the only thing I found were the bones of the animals, flesh torn off and blood licked away. I cried all night, only to wake up with Pepper's skull underneath my pillow. I screamed, locking my bedroom door and closing my window every night onward. Nobody believes it exists. Not even my parents or therapist. However, this online community has helped so much in the past few weeks, and what I now call the Whaler knows its victims are stronger in numbers. After that thing killed my livestock, I chased it into the woods with my Mossberg. I got a clear shot when I got close enough, pulling both triggers right in the head. I fired a second time, dead center. It escaped with nothing but a few bruises where I'd hit it, and the thing faded into the wilderness. After that night, I chose to sleep in the attic, since it's the only room in my house with one entrance. One night, however, it climbed the tree next to the attic window, smiling at me. I just wanted to go away, but it won't. Every night at 12.32, it bangs on my door. I can't handle this anymore. I love you, Lucy. But I have to go. It's strange to meet a group that's had the same experiences that I have. Unfortunately for me, however, not only was I cursed with that thing's face torturing my memory, my biology career is in ruins. Nobody will peer review my work anymore. And my image has been reduced to that of a pseudoscientist or dubious cryptozoologist. Worst of all, the creature broke into the university lab and smashed the equipment, setting back our research by decades. When my colleagues elect to blame me for the incident, my tenure and my job are over. I saw its pale skin and heard its whining. Its eyes were black, like the beady eyes of a stuffed animal. But they were scanning me for something. I think he knows more about me than I do. I know his name is Lucifer. What can I say? When I started reading this thread, I thought it was nonsensical gibberish. This place was loony land. But then it came through my bulkhead, and this thread became my home. While my parents were away for the weekend, I got high and hallucinated the monster you guys are talking about. I thought it was just a bad trip, but when my parents got back, 
they saw it too. I was freaked out, and it was gone by the time the cops showed up. Some of my friends have seen it too. I know it's out there. Somewhere. When I first saw the whaler, he was crouched behind my laundry machine. I bolted upstairs and slammed the door shut, calling the police because I thought there was an intruder in the house. The police showed up and cleared the house and, instead of finding an intruder behind the laundry machine, they found a mannequin. Obviously, they thought my mind was playing tricks on me and they wouldn't listen when I tried to explain the mannequin hadn't been there when I'd seen the man. The whaler showed up again, this time in my attic, and I turned to the bishop at my town's cathedral. He sent a priest over to bless the house, who was supposed to exorcise the house of evil, but by the end of it all, the priest was bleeding out on the floor, and the creature had jumped out my attic window. The priest didn't make it. I keep ignoring the cathedral calls, and I had to get rid of his body. <sighs> I don't want to go to jail. Look guys, some of you have pointed out that this thing might be a failed science experiment or a weird creation of the CIA or something, but accounts of him date back to ancient times. Some ancient Egyptian depictions of the demon, Shizmu, look a bit like him. And some stories about the American Indian Wendigo describe this thing's activities. It's my opinion that he's some ancient astronaut left behind on our planet. It's unbelievable stuff. I know it is. But that's not all there is for me to tell you. A circle of mainstream historians blames the whaler for mysteries and tragedies ranging from the abandoning of the Roanoke colony to the Jack the Ripper killings. In fact, after doing some research, I am 99% positive the whaler was responsible for the Dyatlov Pass incident where nine hikers died in the Russian wilderness. Some of them died of hypothermia, but the medical examiner stated an unknown compelling force mutilated the others. Furthermore, the authorities discovered that the bodies had traces of radiation. What could maul a group of hikers and leave unexplained radiation in its wake? I hope you know the correct answer. Those accounts aside, you might not grasp this yet, but at least one whaler is roaming the earth, terrorizing, killing, maybe reproducing. If you're a smart person who's reluctant to believe without evidence, there's plenty of video and photographic evidence that exists on the web. If you do know how to find it, and if you do locate it, watch at your own risk. For this is serious business that can kill you or ruin your life. But for those inquisitive and brave enough to proceed, I'll provide you with one link. Happy hunting. The Waterfall Today is the day. Today marks the one year anniversary since that horrible night. Although it has been a year, I remember everything so clearly. I remember every thought going through my head. I remember the color of those dead, blackened eyes. I... Remember the length of those sharp, jagged teeth. I remember every single thing about that. I do not even know what that thing was. For the past year, I have had no other thought than to refer to whatever that creature was as Diabolus, which is Latin for devil. Everything had been going so well for me. I was doing great in school. I had the perfect boyfriend and had an exceptional amount of friends. Everything was so perfect, until Amber invited me and a couple of other friends to her house. At Amber's house, well, everyone was bored beyond belief, and we were just looking for something fun to do. What usually happens in situations like this is someone suggests a game of truth or dare, and everyone reluctantly agrees as there is nothing better to do. Amber's house is located in the middle of the woods. 
Within these woods, there is a small waterfall, making it perfect for dares that make people shake with fear. The game progressed slowly because everyone refused to choose dare, fearing the consequences. I, however, wanted to be a brave soul and be the first to choose dare. Dear Lord, I was such a fool. David, my best friend at the time, dared me to take a 15-minute stroll through the woods without a flashlight and without my phone. I thought I had to prove myself to my friends. I somehow managed to push my pride far ahead of my judgement and all regards for safety. I was just about to walk outside when I realised that without my phone, I would have no idea when 15 minutes would be up. I turned to David and asked him for his watch. Before handing me the watch, he set it to go off in 15 minutes. With that, I was off to complete my dare. From the moment I stepped outside, I knew something just was not right. I had that burning feeling that I was being watched. I could not go back now. My friends would laugh at me. I had to push through the fear, no matter how much it consumed me. Despite my hopes that the fears would dissolve and I would laugh and my childlike beliefs that a monster was lurking somewhere in the woods, those feelings only grew stronger. Within five minutes, all of my senses were heightened, adrenaline was coursing through my veins, and my heart was beating straight through my chest. I tried to tell myself that I was being ridiculous, and that I would return to Amber's house within 15 minutes completely unharmed. But my thoughts were shattered by the sound of sticks snapping under the steps of someone or something. I froze dead in my tracks. My heart stopped and found its way into my throat. I wanted to faint, but I knew that if I did, whatever it was that was in the woods with me would find me. I hid behind the tree next to me. That is when I first caught sight of the creature, the Diabolus. The creature was horrendous. It had razor sharp teeth and grey skin covered in scales. Its eyes, those dark, Deep pools of solid black are what have forever engraved themselves into my memory. I wanted to scream, I wanted to run, but I knew that if I dared move a muscle, it would find me. The Diabolus would kill me. Relief began to rush in when I saw it become uninterested with the area and continue to a different part of the woods. I was almost happy, all until the watch began to beep. <laughs> I have never heard anything so loud in my life. The watch beeped so tauntingly, as if to say, Congratulations! Your 15 minutes is up! The last 15 minutes of your life, that is. I tried my hardest to conceal the noise, but nothing would work. The creature stopped and whipped its head around, and strangely began to sniff the air. I actually began to wonder what on earth the creature was trying to smell. When it quickly turned its head in my direction, I realized he was trying to determine my scent. The second my gaze met that of the Diabolus, my feet acted on their own and began to run. I have never ran so fast in my entire life. I ran deeper into the woods, never looking back. I could hear the Diabolus running behind me. I heard its labored breathing, the breathing of a bloodthirsty creature that would do anything to acquire the flesh of its chosen prey. I found a large rock and began to slide myself under it, I looked at the watch, while at the same time listening to the footsteps of the creature. 11.45. I thought to myself, 11.45 is the time I will die. Exactly one hour after leaving the safety of Amber's house will be the time of my death. Gosh. The footsteps stopped. I listened closely, praying. The Diabolus had lost interest in finding me. I shuddered when I realized that it had only paused in an attempt to trace my scent. By the rapid pace of its breathing, I noticed that the Diabolus was closer to locating me. I quickly bolted out from underneath the rock and ran towards the fall. The waterfall was my last hope. I did not dare to look back. As soon as I got to the waterfall, I dove right into the water and hid behind the fall. I closed my eyes and began to think. I had accepted the fact that if the Diabolus was still able to find me, I would not see daylight ever again. 
I opened my eyes again. I realized that there was a break in the fall, and I was able to see all around me. Emerging from the woods, I saw the Diabolus. He must have been seven feet tall. I nearly fainted from fright, but I managed to hold myself together. I saw the creature lift its nose high into the air in hopes of detecting my scent. He stood there for five minutes, smelling the air. Right then, my prayers had been answered. The creature began to retreat back into the woods. Relief flooded me, making my body go numb. I did not care to move from my spot behind the waterfall. And I stayed there till daylight broke, and I could hear my friends in the distance desperately calling my name. I emerged from the falls and ran into their comforting arms. I told them of the nightmare I had endured throughout the night. They began to look at me strangely, but I told them every single detail. Although it has been a year since that terror-filled night, I still remember every detail. Most people block out traumatic events and fail to recall simple facts from the event. But because they put me in this big white room with nothing in it and my hands restrained in an odd jacket, I have had nothing better to do but recall every detail for the last 365 days. I try telling the man in the white jacket with the clipboard my story, but he does not seem to listen to me. The whole time he is in my room, he is writing something on the clipboard. I try to ask him to please let me tell my story, but every time he leaves my room, I hear him say into a small recording voice, the patient is showing no signs of progress. <sighs> I wonder what he means by that. Well, listeners, nothing quite like some outer planescape monster whisking people away to alternate universes of the void, whose sky is made of pure red. Such a terrible way to go, if only she listened to the tale and believed it. And the whale is a really interesting story, mate. I'll link a very short YouTube video to the topic in the show notes so you can check it out, if you dare. <laughs> Nothing quite like a cryptid investigation, mates. And the waterfall was one such story that had me on the edge of my seat. A wonderfully lucky ending. Well, if you can call being alive in a sanatorium lucky. Yeah. Thank you all for being awesome and listening, mates. If you have a couple of seconds, swing by and leave an iTunes review. For those of you who have, thank you so much. And if you're wondering how to do this, click on my link in my show notes and then my logo in iTunes. Boom. You can leave an iTunes review just like that. Okay, mates. Have a fantastic day or night. This Wednesday will be more creepy stories. And as always, till next we meet.